Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Ben, and in this episode of the Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast, we're continuing our series of conversations with the most influential women in barbecue with Amanda Trapnell, co-founder of Native Harvest, a business that uses native herbs and spices to create delicious and unique rubs. This is the internationally awarded Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast with your host, Ben Arnott. How long has it been since your last confession? Amanda, it's great to see you. You've got some beautiful blue sky there behind you. You're obviously having a great day. It's been fantastic so far. I've got um, some ribs on my Weber waiting to be revealed later on and friends and family coming over for dinner after this. Oh, wow. So we're actually going to get a bit of a sneak peek at the, uh, at the family dinner. Oh, I'd say they'd be here afterwards and, and they won't want to share. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, but you're, but you're going to show us though, right? I will. I will show you. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, okay, so uh, welcome to the confessional. It's, uh, it's, it's great to see you here. We, we have a mutual friend, Brett Connell. We do. Um, I've known Brett for probably about 15 years, maybe a little bit longer. Um, we used to work together. Um, and I think too also Anthony is one of my best friend's husbands, Anthony Goulding. Oh, yes. Actually, I was, I've just been chatting with him on, on Facebook Live here right before we got started. Oh, lovely. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've uh, cooked at a couple of competitions with Anthony and I've, um, I've competed against Brett several times. So did you know Brett back in his triathlon days? No, I knew Brett in his publican days. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. I actually didn't know that he used to run a pub. He's a man of many, uh, many talents. He absolutely is. I, I, he's done many, many things and, um, and barbecue is he's right up there with that at the moment. Yeah. So. yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so tell me then, what was the last thing that you barbecued? Um, probably a beef tenderloin. Um, and right now I'm barbecuing some pork ribs with, uh, it's got a hibiscus and pepperberry rub and then a, a tangy hibiscus glaze is going to go on later. Oh, beautiful. That sounds amazing. So it's good. divine. It's really, really different. It smells and tastes so good. Yeah, yeah. So is that your, your favourite thing to barbecue, is it, the, the pork ribs? I, when I've got time, I don't. I, I love bar- barbecuing pork ribs, um, but quite often I have kids, so quite often I don't have the time <laughs> to spend hours over the barbecue, which would be nice. Otherwise, I'd, I'll, I'll do a quick grill. Yeah, I hear that. The kids sort of tend to make things a bit harder, don't they? Absolutely. So um, walk us through how you, uh, how you like to cook that. Um, with the beef, are we talking? Sure, sure. Yep. Okay, would you like me to show you how I prepare it? Oh, we might save that for a bit later. Should we switch to the pork ribs then and then we'll save the beef for later? Okay, that sounds good. Uh, So the pork ribs that I put on this morning, it was quite early, probably about 6 o'clock this morning. Um, I've just set it up with the coal set up in a a snake method Um, and they've been cooking since about 6 a.m., yeah, Um, and I've just put pepperberry, um, ground rosella, which is hibiscus, uh, and some pure salt on there. Cooked it for about four to six hours, quite low, um, about 120 degrees. And I've just, just before we started, actually wrapped it in foil with a bit of butter and brown sugar. So hopefully towards the end of here we'll be glazing it with a uh, hibiscus glaze, which I've got here. Oh, that looks sensational. Beautiful. Oh, it's such it's an incredible red colour. Very deep purple there, isn't it? It's like, yeah. a, like a thick red wine almost colour. It is. It's gorgeous. Um, so look forward to that towards the end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, you said you put the ribs on at, at 6 o'clock. I know you're actually just up the road from me. You're just a couple of suburbs away. It's now 2 p.m. <laughs> as we're recording this. That's a really yes. long rib cook. That's a. It, it's a 2.2 kilo rib. Oh, okay. So, oh, yeah, it's a big one. <laughs> um, and it started off quite low, probably about 100 degrees. So um, uh, okay. about 135, oh, 120 now. Yeah. So we'll see. <laughs> yeah, right. And you, you mentioned the, the snake method. So I'm assuming that it's all done on a Weber kettle? It is all done on a Weber kettle. That's where I do most of my barbecuing. Yep. Cool. And is that your, your, your favourite barbecue or do you have... Do you have many barbecues? 
Um, my husband said we can't get another barbecue until I sell my moped. <laughs> You Which have I haven't moped. used for about a year. I do. I impulse bought a moped a couple of years ago um, <laughs> when petrol prices went a bit crazy. <laughs> Great time to break the moped out right now then. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. Um, but, yes, I think I prefer a new barbecue. <laughs> okay. All yeah. right. But I, I love the kettle. Um, it, you know, it's, it's nothing too fancy, but you get the job done and it tastes amazing. Yeah, yeah. So what are you thinking you're going to trade the moped in on? Are you Have you got your eyes on a particular grill? I haven't, but as you said, I might I might check with Brett Connell and Anthony Gordon to see what they recommend. I'd love a smoker. Oh, okay. I know that they've both got um, ceramics, so they'll probably put you onto a ceramic barbecue. And I'll end up with, with barbecues lying down the side of my house. I can see it now. <laughs> Just like the rest of us. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> It'd be Sounds great. perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So tell me, how did you how did you get into barbecue? Um, I, I think I've always loved cooking. I've always loved flavour, um, and it's just another way to do it. And I mean, living on the Gold Coast in Queensland, there's nothing better than a, than a weekend or Sunday afternoon barbecue. So just um, just testing it out and, and and watching quite a few videos. I actually watched your pork rib videos a while ago and um, got some great tips from that. So Oh, Thank very you. good. You're welcome. You're welcome. We, yeah, we did pretty so, well with that video. Yeah, fantastic. Um, yeah, so just testing and seeing what other people are doing, getting tips from other people and, and, and just having a go really. Um, I think it's one of those things where you get your own style and your own feel and, and your own what works well for you. So, yeah. It definitely is, yeah. So what's a, what are some of the biggest lessons that you've learned so far in your, in your barbecue journey? Oh, I had a really nice um, rack of ribs, which I know it was a beef roast, which I'd put on on direct heat, thought I'd duck inside to do something for about 60 seconds and set it on fire. Ooh. (laughs) Yeah, so never, ever (laughs) leave anything there for however long. So it was a bit unfortunate, but managed to save it in the end and it wasn't too bad. Um, Yeah, and I I guess the other thing is no matter what you're doing, whenever you're barbecuing, is enjoy it. Enjoy Definitely, what you're yeah, doing. Yeah. Enjoy what you're making and enjoy what you end up, the, end, the finished result. So, yeah. yeah. So how did that catch fire? Was it just fat dripping down onto the coals and then the yes. flames licking yes. up back up onto the yep. meat? And- so I was kind of searing it, um, searing it on all sides and I kind of left it there for a couple of minutes and thought I'll just duck in and do something and it just whoosh. <laughs> wasn't great. <laughs> Yeah, well, look, if it makes you feel any better, I've actually done that twice on, on gas barbecues, so I nearly blew the house up twice. Oh, wow. That's impressive. I also, I also did a lamb rack, which is really upsetting as well, and all the, all the little bones just disintegrated. I thought, oh, my God. Oh, <laughs> that one no. was left there for a bit too long. Yeah, not fun. <laughs> so definitely a few fails there. But, um, yeah, cooking with some of the natives, I think I've got some – really good favourites that I that I make now. So, yeah. Tell us about some of them. Um, so for fish, sometimes yeah. I'll wrap that in um, paper bark. So you just dampen the paper bark down, um, get whatever piece of fish you like. I've used whiting, um, barramundi is really, really lovely. And the paper bark gives it a very, very subtle smoky flavour um because you don't want to overpower any kind of seafood um and do that with a bit of lemon myrtle a bit of native thyme and just some normal lemon squeezed over it wrapped up and away you go it's beautiful do you actually add smoking wood to it or do you um just let the paper bark do its thing yeah the paper bark does its thing and it yeah you don't need the smoking wood um and you get enough flavor that way so yeah definitely worth a try if you've got a yeah. paper bark tree out the back <laughs> I Rip don't actually. <laughs> I'll have um, to go down to the can. local park and just start stripping it off the tree down <laughs> yeah. the park. You just want to make sure that they haven't sprayed anything awful. Um, <laughs> but you can you can actually get paper bark um, online um, or send me an email and I'll find some for you. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. So does the yeah. does wetting the paper bark does that stop it? Because I'd imagine that it would stick to the it would stick to the fish. So if you wet it, does it then not stick to the fish? 
Um, yes, but it also means that it just lasts a bit longer because it's quite fine um, and you don't want it to just go up. So just gently, and I mean, you're not cooking fish for that long, but you don't want your paper bark getting upset or getting, you know, a yucky flavour yeah, from yeah, cooking yeah. too fast. So, yeah, no, it's a, yeah, definitely a great recipe. Um, probably some of the other thing, I love to do a lamb rack um, and sometimes, I don't know if you've heard of pepperberry or Tasmanian mountain pepper, mm-hmm. um, beautiful peppery flavour with a bit of a chilli berry zing at the end of it. Um, sometimes I'll cook, you know, a lamb rack with just salt and a bit of pepperberry on it and it just comes out delicious. It's amazing. Um, yeah, a few other things that I'd probably do. I've done a – today we're doing something with rosella, but I've done Davidson plum or – um, which most of you might have heard of. It's become a bit more popular. Um, the other one is, which you may not have heard of, is called rye berry. Um, that one's also known as lily pilly, which I don't know oh, if you... Oh, okay. Yeah, so if you've got a le- lily pilly hedge out the front of your house, you, it's most likely that you can eat those. So they're quite a tart um, berry. So, they, you know, you crush that up and it would go well with lamb um, or pork. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. Delicious. Mm. Yeah, we've actually um, I've had to keep the keep the lily pilly hedge all trimmed back close at the front of the house because the birds kept coming and eating the lily pillies and then pooping on my good. car. <laughs> yeah, and then pooping on my car, but the poop is really acidic and actually burns little holes in the paint on my car. It is. Uh, the, the lily pilly berries or rye berry, they're quite they're quite tart, so they're they're a bit acidic. So you're better off harvesting them making a glaze out of them and then the birds won't have any tea. <laughs> Sounds good to me and it saves yeah. my truck too. Absolutely. Yeah. So I've, I, I did just have one more question about that fish. I'm just obsessed with this idea of this paper bark fish. Yeah. When So once it's all wrapped up and it's ready to go, are you grilling it directly over the coals or are you doing an, an offset style cooking? You're doing it offset because you don't want okay. too much heat in there. Um, and probably d- depending on the size of the fish, um, it's not going to take that long to cook, maybe 15, 20 minutes, half an hour. Depends on oh, what okay. temp you've got there. Yeah. So just I'm going to give that a crack. <laughs> it's definitely worth what. Would you like me to get you some paper bark? Yeah, please. Please do. Yeah, you've, absolutely. You've already got my email address. <laughs> we'll, we'll tee it yeah, up after I we're will finished. Send it <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Not I love that problem. idea. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the flavor is because, you know, it, it's very different to smoking with hardwood or something like that. Um, the flavor is quite delicate. It's got a slightly. Um, just a very subtle eucalyptusy kind of flavour. Yeah, mm. definitely worth trying. And beautiful, beautiful with white fish, especially. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do you find mm. living on the Gold Coast and and doing all this work with these native ingredients? Do you find that there's a lot sort of more seafood sort of oriented recipes appearing here on the here in Southeast Queensland? Yes and no. Um, they're coming everywhere. And, I mean, we have fa- fabulous seafood in southeast Queensland. It's amazing. Um, I quite often will buy prawns off the trawler and do um, salt and pepper berry prawns on the barbecue. Ooh. I've done that before. Um, and scallops with a bit of pepper berry on them are just ridiculous. Yeah. Ridiculous. <laughs> Here's one thing that, that my wife and I always disagree on, and that is do you cook the prawns with the shell on or off? Uh, if you're cooking them on the barbecue, you can do both. Really, it depends on it depends on what you like. But you, you're definitely getting the green prawn. I mean, the skins. I mean, the flesh is so delicate that if you're cooking it on a barbecue, you'd probably want to have them shell on, and then peel them after. Okay, and yeah. the, the 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 spices then are just kind of on your fingers as you're eating then. <laughs> a little bit, but you know, if you're sitting there, it, it goes through. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. It's good. No, awesome. Awesome. Um, okay, so have you ever, like, uh, judged barbecue or been to a barbecue comp? I find it hard if you've known Brett Connell for so long that he hasn't dragged you along to a barbecue competition. I have been past. There's one at Burley that I've been to. Um, I didn't oh. get to see Brett there because he was all, all busy. But, um, yeah, it was fabulous. It was, it was a little while ago, but I have been watching very avidly um, the meat stock videos you've been posting which is fabulous just incredible yeah meat stock is wonderful we just had it in in toowoomba just last weekend it was fantastic to have it in queensland for the first time 
I saw that and it just um, so many competitors and so much. It was huge by the looks of it. We, we basically filled the entire Toowoomba showgrounds. Um, not not just with the barbecue competition. There was you know, like a huge stage with country music stars and a an expo area and a I rodeo. I heard there was a bit of rodeo, yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah, it was a big weekend. Very That's good fabulous. stuff. <laughs> yeah. And it sounds like you did really well. Yeah, we did all right. We did all right. In the, uh, in the ABA Awards night, we picked up second place for that pork rib video that you were just mentioning before for, um, for video of the year. So we're very happy with that. Definitely worth it. It was very yeah. helpful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, okay, so you've, you've been along to Burley. You're into seafood. So you know, th- there were seafood categories there at the Burley barbecue competition. That's one of the things that made Burley unique was that it was the only barbecue competition on the circuit that had a seafood category. So, what, but one thing that I'm really interested in, and I think that you're probably the best person for me to talk to about this, is I want to see native proteins in competition. So we do Absolutely. beef, we do pork ribs, we do chicken, we do lamb. I want to see kangaroo, emu, crocodile as a Witchy regular grub. thing. <laughs> Witchity grubs. Well, yeah. mm, I, okay, they're let, hard let, to get, but apparently they're a thing. I, I'm not. I'm not a big fan of the witchetty grub, but. <laughs> Look, I I, I haven't tried it. Um, I, the the videos that I saw of the bush tucker man eating them it looked like they were kind of nutty. Yeah, yeah, I I believe they are. <laughs> oh, you you haven't tried them either? No, I have not tried a witch. I've seen them, but I have not tried them. I'm not quite there yet. Okay, um, we've got we we do have an incredible uh, array of Australian meat. So yeah, there should be something where we're cooking our Australian meats. Mm. So have you done much with kangaroo, emu and crocodile? I, had, I haven't done anything with crocodile and crocodile, it gets really rubbery really easily. Mm. Um, kangaroo, I have cooked a little bit. It's, it's not my favourite. It is a bit gamey. Um, I know people who have cooked wallaby and it's got not quite so gamey, but I don't think I'm, <laughs> I don't think I'm ready to barbecue a cute wallaby. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I've I've tried a few kangaroo steaks and that. Um, and there was an emu category at uh, at Smokefest uh, down here in in Mudgerabar last year. Um, I have I seen that. Did you try the emu? I didn't get to try any because I wasn't judging at that competition. Um, oh. I was just wandering around talking to people and having a good time. So I didn't actually get to try any. But um, I've I've heard mixed reviews. <laughs> Does it taste like chicken? <laughs> I think everything tastes Maybe. like chicken if it's not red meat, <laughs> <Probably>. doesn't it? <laughs> Probably. Yeah. Um, yeah, it'd be fabulous. It'd be fabulous if they could introduce something that has native, native Australian meats and flavours because it's so unique to Australia. Um, you don't have these kind of things anywhere else and, and it would be great to showcase what we do have and, and you know, the rich heritage that it's come from. So, yeah. Definitely, yeah. Given that you do love a bit of low and slow, which of those three, kangaroo, emu, or crocodile, do, do you think would would most fit in? So like a standard competition lineup, you've got brisket, you've got pork ribs, you've got open lamb, open chicken. What sort of would be a, a natural fit in there? Um, the kangaroo is quite lean. I would, I would love to have a go at the crocodile and see how that went, but I'm not sure. I'm not well, sure. Probably, yeah. One thing I'd love to see would be like a whole crocodile category. So, like, we have whole hog, we have whole pig. Yes. Who's going to catch them? <laughs> Not me. That'd be ama- that'd be phenomenal. It would be amazing. So, yeah, that definitely worthwhile looking into. Well, I think we're going to write that down in the book. We're going to have a chat with Mr. J. Beaumont and see if we can get it into meat stock. What do you reckon? It'd be show stopping. It would be. It would be. It would be. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's a good point for us to take a little break. We'll be right back in just a moment. In our modern lives, there are some things we need more of. More time, more money, more love from family and friends. Here at Smoking Hot Confessions, we believe all that can be done through barbecue. If this sounds like you too, then you're going to want to keep the last weekend of July free because we are bringing you Barbicon. Barbicon is a two-day virtual event with the sole purpose of helping you save time, save money, and become the envy of your family and friends. We're bringing the best barbecue pitmasters and business owners from around the country live into your living room. They're going to show you not only what they do, but how they do it. If you're a backyard barbecuer, we're going to shorten that learning curve, eliminate the ruined meals going into the bin, and cement you as a barbecue legend among your family and friends. 
And if you're a barbecue business owner, we're going to share all the shortcuts to success, the tips and tricks to trim your budget and maximize profits, and build a thriving business that will help you take care of all your loved ones. Pre-registrations are open now, so hit the link in the description, bang in your details, and you'll be the first to be notified as soon as the early bird tickets are available, any specials that we're running, when we announce presenters, freebies, and more. So I'll see you there. Got a project you'd like to work on with the SHC team? Shoot Ben an email on ben at smokinghotconfessions.com and let's have a conversation. Alrighty, Amanda. Now, of course, your business is Native Harvest and you're a, a founder or a co-founder of that business. T- tell me how it all started. Um, well, obviously, I'm a friend of, friend of Brett Connell's because it started over a lunch with too many beverages. <laughs> As so many um, Brett Connell stories do. I, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, my best ideas come from a boozy lunch. So um, <laughs> just thinking about it, I've, I've always had a bit of a passion for food um, and love cooking, love experimenting and trying new things and just chatting with my sister-in-law about, you know, if you were going to do something with food, what would you do? And um, the conversation led to things like lemon myrtle, which I think, is pretty well known these days um mm. and from there after that we thought oh we should find out more there must surely there must be more native australian ingredients that we could use um for barbecuing um making sauces and rubs and things like that um so joined the queensland bush food association and that was fabulous a whole bunch of people who've been in the native industry for decades who know the ins and outs of everything um it was just a wealth of knowledge to learn from them. But the amount of natives that you can use, there's thousands. Um, and probably we're only just starting to see a few of the really, really popular ones come in. Um, mm-hmm. So I guess you're talking Davidson plum, which is a really lovely tart kind of plum flavor, pepperberry, um, lemon myrtle, as you say, and um, there's quite a few other myrtles. So there's an aniseed myrtle, which is fabulous and would be great. Um, I wow. haven't actually tried that on my barbecue yet, but um, it's, it's an incredible flavour as well. Um, cinnamon myrtle. So there's a whole bunch of Australian herbs and spices that um, are somewhat familiar um, but and, and are, can be used similarly, but uh, just pack a punch and they've got an incredible flavour and smell. So, yeah. Um, that's how I kind of got into it and just played around with them because some of them are, are really different and really unusual. There's a bush tomato that's a tiny little berry that you crush up and kind of tastes like... Um, tomato? It kind of tastes like tomato, <laughs> but it's got a bit of a caramelly, spicy flavour to it. So, you know, it's like normal with a little bit of an extra zhuzh at the end. <laughs> okay, a bit of zhuzh, I like that. Yeah. Now, the the Queensland Bush Food Association is that like a survivalist group? Is that like this is what you can eat if you're out camping in the bush, or is it is it a more of a bit. commercial sort of focused um, group? Hobby farmers and backyard growers and things like that. Um, people who are creating small craft businesses. Um, just a, a group of people get together and, and learn a bit more about natives and how to use them and, and how to take care of them as well. So, okay. yeah, that was phenomenal. And, and, I mean, they have people that are, are members that are researchers from universities down to the man who's retired and wants to grow some natives in his backyard. So a really interesting mix of people <laughs> with lots wow. of knowledge. Yeah, mm. right. And are natives reasonably easy to grow in your backyard at home? I, I'm not much of a green thumb. Um, but my mum and my sister is, and at the moment, um, I, so I farmed some of my native, I, I killed mine. <laughs> I think the only thing I can grow is lemon myrtle. Um, but my mum has an acre um, of land and she's quite a green thumb and she's got a Davidson plum growing. Um, she's got some aniseed myrtle down there. Uh, and I think my sister's got some native thyme and some river mint in her garden. So they're taking oh, right. care of it for me. Oh, there um, you go. The, Davids, the Davidson plum is just an incredible plant. It, it actually grows the plums directly out of the trunk. So d- not off the branches. It looks so oh, weird. Wow. So got these clumps of big um, purple fruit that just grow up the trunk. <laughs> That's really interesting. I'm going to have to go and Google yeah. that when we're done here and yeah. go have a look at it. Yeah, absolutely. That, it's fascinating. And, you know, the, mo- the more I learn about it, the more I realise I don't know. And, and quite a few 
of the natives have either health benefits or other uses. So I think traditionally um, Indigenous people use pepperberry for flavour but also for pre preserving because it has um, anti antibacterial properties um, and they also used to chew on a pepperberry if they had a toothache. So, yeah, I had a huge amount of knowledge and a lot of herbs and spices that are naturally grown here that we, we often don't use. So it would be great if we could see more native herbs and spices in barbecue. Absolutely it would, yeah. No doubt about that at all. Now, you mentioned that your business partner is your sister-in-law. When most people hear that the in-laws are coming, they go, oh, God. And then you mentioned that your that your sister and your mother are also growing sort of plants for you as well. Yeah, it's it's a family affair. <laughs> My husband eats what I cook. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. So you the, the the businesses sort of really brought your family together. Yeah, a little bit. My sister in law has actually gone off now. She is. Um, we started off the business with a with a um, a view to focus on aviation. Um, so getting native salt and pepper on the airlines, and then. Hit. So we kind of had to back off out of there. So she's continue on, continued on in aviation but has been a brilliant support um, through the process. So, yeah, it has definitely been a family affair. Yeah, right. Excellent. I, I love how barbecue can sort of bring people together like that. Now, we've, we've talked about a bunch of different um, spices and things and different herbs, but one thing I did see on your uh, website was that you're talking about native plants. So what sort of plants do you use as opposed to like herbs and spices? Um, so most of them, um, most of the most of the dried herbs that you'll see on there, um, you've got the, the fresh plants that you can use it from as well. So um, if you do want to get your own plants, I think Bunnings has a range called tuck, Tuckerbush at the moment, so you can get them from there. But there are growers and, and sellers um, all over Australia that would do things like that. So... If you're using fresh straight from the plant, which I've got a lemon myrtle tree, um, just pick the leaves off um, and use them either kind of like a, a lemony bay leaf. You can use it like that. Um, you can stick a fresh leaf straight on your fish when you're putting it in the uh, in the paper bark. Um, yeah, so you can use fre fresh or dried. It doesn't matter. But um, it, it's nice to have some of those native plants around where you can just go out and pick something off and, and use it in your barbecuing. <laughs> Look, we um, I've I've uh, started a little uh, vegetable garden down here, which was part of my son's science projects when he was uh, uh, homeschooling during all the all the madness there two years ago. Oh, that was crazy. Mm, and uh, I've 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 still got it running now, and I've got basil, I've got oregano, thyme, and I I just love going downstairs with a pair of scissors and going snip 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 and throwing it into the dinner. It's and it just That's brilliant. The, the fresh herbs just make it so much better. Absolutely. Um, so probably the ones that you could, the native herbs and kind of thing that you could stick in your garden um, that are easy to grow, uh, river mint, which mm -hmm. is kind of a little shrubby thing and, and it's got a bit of a spearmint flavour, so it's not quite as intense as, as your regular mint. Um, native thyme is another one that's a bit shrubby and that's really lovely too. Um, and, and just get a le little lemon myrtle tree, stick it in a pot so it won't take over your backyard. <laughs> Um, and pick the leaves up and, and use them when you want. Excellent. I'm just writing all this down as you're <laughs> yeah. saying it because I'm going to do that this weekend. It's a long weekend coming up. I'm going to go to Bunnings and go get all these things. Yeah, and let me know if you can't find something because there's some, there's some good little little places. There is actually a um, sim, very similar to pepperberry. It's a relative of pepperberry um, called the pepper vine, which does grow in Queensland. Okay. Um, but I've not had, I've, I've killed every one of those. So <laughs> they're, they're quite delicate. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not, I'm, I'm not the best, uh, the best green thumb out there. So that's, well, it's going to have those. to be hardy if it's going to live at my house. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> now, um, the, the other thing that I did see on your website that I thought was really interesting, you've written that all your products are sustainably and ethically farmed. Now, that's that's often a phrase that we hear when we're talking about livestock farms, where our proteins come from, you know, ethically raised meat and pork and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. How does that work in in non-meat farms? Like, how, how is it ethically So, particularly uh, because it, well, because native... There's probably a few things involved there. Being ethically farmed is that they, instead of just, you know, being sustainable, that it's actually about regenerating the land. So you're not just um, farming it dry and then moving on to the next bit. You're actually 
making sure that you're leaving it in, in a good condition, um, leaving things fallow and things like that. Um, they make sure all the businesses that we have been involved in either um, are Indigenous organisations and we buy directly from them or they support Indigenous communities. Um, yeah, all of them are organic. Um, they're completely traceable. All of their farming practices are, are ethical. Um, yeah, and we buy our products direct from direct from the farmers and the producers, so we know exactly where it comes from, and we actually can say that. Um, mm. So, for for example, one of our pepperberry farmers, um, because it's completely organic, they don't spray them. Um, he nets them, but he was complaining that all the tarongs were eating the pepperberries that he couldn't keep up. <laughs> Um, so yeah, absolutely, and and I think it's really important these days to make sure you know you a know where, not not only your meat, but you know where all your products come from and what's in them too. Hmm. Definitely, yeah. I I found that really interesting that, that you mentioned fallowing before. Now I I grew up on a farm. I know what that is, but for any viewers or listeners that are not familiar with it, could you just explain what that means in terms of the farming cycle? Yeah, I do, I, I'm not a farming expert, but I believe it. You know once every seven years or when the when the land needs to be regenerated, you'd let, you'll leave that field to rest and renew itself. Um, yeah. yeah. Basically sort of uh, dividing the properties into four is how I understand it. And you, you, yeah, only, and so you, you only use three of them at a time sort of thing. And then you turn it around. So, you, mm. so you're constantly making sure that you're letting the land regenerate itself um, and, you know, the farm's, are not just clearing huge amounts amounts of bushland to to install their staff. So yeah, no, we de we deal with good people because yeah, not just not just good producers of great food, but people who do the right thing as well. Yeah, yeah, and we're we're starting to become more aware as a society of how important all that sort of stuff is for the for the planet and and for what we're hoping to do with it for our children and all that sort of stuff. Now, you just mentioned there before the indigenous connections. Um, to your businesses and I thought that was a really interesting sort of topic to sort of explore a bit there because there's we've just seen it happen in the last oh well, I suppose it'd be a what, little while ago now uh, all the all the business in the news with milk and farmers and buying it at the supermarket for this much and only that much going to the farmers and you're obviously buying directly from these indigenous connections so that money that you're spending is going directly to them so what sort of um like community benefits have you seen from from your business interactions? Um, I think when you're when you're directly supporting an indi an indigenous business, you're you're growing indigenous business owners um, or or supporting indigenous business owners. Quite often, I think um, big conglomerates get a hold of a great idea um, and use the knowledge. Um, you know, this is, it's a culture that's 65,000 years old and everything we know what to eat is, is from Indigenous communities. Um, so we shouldn't just be taking that. The profit needs to be passed on or, or the profit needs to go directly to Indigenous growers and suppliers. Um, yeah. Definitely some good work there to be, uh, to be sure. Um, so in your... Um, workings with these indigenous herbs and spices have you picked up any of the indigenous cooking styles because i know that you said that you love cooking have you picked up any uh you 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 did mention the paper bark fish there earlier have you learned some other Absolutely. tricks there as well um i have done i have done a damper um so i think damper is probably a bit of a european word but um i'm sure you've heard of using wattle seed for whatever and rubs and stuff. Um, wattle seeds used to be ground up and used for flour to make it like a damper style thing and, and shove oh, it in wow. the fire. So I have done that. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, yeah, it wasn't wasn't used kind of the way that we use it, but um, more, more for making a flour. Hmm. Right, and how did that turn out? Um, it was my first go, so it wasn't it wasn't fantastic. And I mean, damp is quite tough as it is, um, but it does have like it does have an interesting nutty flavour. So um, it's probably definitely worth another attempt. <laughs> okay, all right. Did you put some uh, some some butter and some uh, golden syrup or treacle on it? Um, I think I, I think it was honey that I used, which which is what I had at the time. But um, yeah, I didn't love it. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> but but it was interesting. I mean, it's it's a different flavor and it's a different style. 
um, to what you're used to. So sometimes that takes a bit of practice to get it right too. I probably needed some some better um, someone to pass that detail on to me on how to make it taste good. <laughs> next time. There's always next time. Yeah, absolutely. That's yeah, my new yeah. challenge. Yeah. Now we've we've talked about how you're based here in southeast Queensland. A lot of your products come from all around the country, though. Can you give us a bit of an idea of where some some of the different things come from? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the rosella that we're using today comes from North Queensland, um, so that is primarily found in in Queensland and New South Wales. But this particular one comes from North Queensland. Um, the pepperberry is mostly only found in like the highlands of Tasmania. Uh, there is a little bit around the Canberra area and southern New South Wales. Um, our salt comes from Victoria, um, which is beautiful. It comes from a pink lake in Victoria and it's hand harvested down there. Oh, wow. Um, things like, yeah, it's, it's phenomenal. Um, they only, and, and same for that in terms of being, being ethical and sustainable, they only harvest once a year um, and only take so much. So it, it never is a problem you're not stripping the lake bare of salt so yeah um we get some salt from the murray darling basin um and that again actually aids in balancing the the salinity issue that's down there so but that again they only take so much and and make sure there's something in for the next the next person so yeah, well, I know that there's a that there's a huge problem with with salt in the Murray Darling Basin. So the more you can get out of here, the I'm more helping. you can extract that, <laughs> the better. Yeah, so yeah, so I think um, quite a few quite a few of these organisations are interested in, in not taking out more than more than you should. So um, it's nice to support them too. Yeah, well, we were discussing the the, the ethical farming processes before. It's the it's the unethical farming that's happened in the past that's what is what has messed up the Murray Darling. So yeah, I'm, absolutely. I'm, I'm really happy to, to to hear that there's some of that uh some of that salinity being put to good use. Yeah. <laughs> On the dinner table. <laughs> yeah. Salting my meat. <laughs> yes. But it's beautiful. I mean, you can taste the difference between something that's that's pure, hasn't been processed, doesn't have most of the salt you'll buy, even kosher salt will have anti caking agents in it. Um, and it does change the flavour. It does, like, when, when you do have it, when it is processed or you do have extra chemicals in there, you do have a little chemically tang to it. Um, yeah, so it, not only are they good for the environment, they taste amazing. Yeah, yeah. I want to circle back to one thing that you did say before. You, you mentioned rosella twice. Now, the only rosella that I know is the, is the parrot-like the bird. bird. Are, you, are yes. you telling me that, that you're cooking parrots? No. <laughs> so I don't know if you've ever seen, so sometimes in bottle shops they have jarred hibiscus. Mm -hmm. um, in Australia we have a, oh, the Australian version of hibiscus is called rosella and mm -hmm. I've got some here that you can have a look at. It's like dried flower flakes. Oh, um, right, so okay. Yeah, yeah. So the rosella is not a bird. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a beautiful um, deep red hibiscus flower. So there are similar versions to hibiscus, or to rosella or hibiscus, you can call it either or, um, in other countries. Um, and, for example, at the moment in the US, I think um, hibiscus is one of the New York Times flavours of the year. So that's pretty fantastic. Ah. Yeah. Good time to start buying some stock in hibiscus. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, but not just for that. It's a, it's a great flavour. It's really, really unique and, and so different from so many of the normal flavours we've been using over and over again. Mm, yeah, it's always good to, to branch out and try some new stuff. Now, I mm. want to play a little word association game with you. I'm going to throw out a meat <laughs> and I want you to come back with the first uh, oh, native no. <laughs> spice, or pro, uh, oh, okay. spice or herb that, that, that comes to mind. Okay. So mm -hmm. we'll start with an easy one, ribeye steak. Um, I would probably use, I'd, to be honest, if it's a really good one, I would just use salt and a bit of pepperberry to flavour it. Awesome. Chicken breast. That's pretty boring. Um, I would do a lemon myrtle and native thyme with that. Okay. Pork belly. Pork belly. Um, that, this is where you could use your lily pillies <laughs> um, and make it like a sticky sweet kind of tart 
thing with your pork belly. Um, you, so for pork belly, I'd probably go probably Asian flavors. So the other one that you can use is something called Geraldton Wax, um, which gives it a little slightly citrusy flavor, which is phenomenal. So you could pretty much do your normal thing that you want to do with your, with your pork belly if it's an Asian flavor and just add a bit of that into it um, to give it just that extra wow factor. Really nice, really nice. And how about a, a, a lamb shoulder for like a pulled lamb? Oh, I would probably do. Um, you could do a bit of. You could do a bit of river mint. Um, you could do a combination of the native basil and native thyme, and they're they're phenomenal. They kind of um, native basil has a bit of a flavour of um, basil, a bit of a minty flavour. Um, and the native thyme has kind of a sage oregano thyme flavour. So you've got all these beautiful flavours coming through. But you don't need to, you don't, with natives, they're quite potent. So you don't need to use a lot of different flavours. Otherwise, you're going to overdo it. Yeah, mm. fair enough. Now, all right, last one, a bit of an alternative protein that's um, uh, <laughs> a, a fella at, at Burley actually came up and approached me and handed me a business card. And I've had, never seen or heard of him since. But anyway, camel. Camel, weird. Apparently Australia has more camels than parts of the Middle East. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they're feral camels, so probably camels and kangaroos. Um, yeah. Uh, camel, I would probably do. <laughs> have you tried know, camel that's before? A tough one. I haven't tried camel, but I do know people that have and they, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, with camel, I would think that you would do something probably similar to chicken. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know. Or pork, maybe. I don't feel like it's a full-on red meat. I don't know. All right. All right. What do you I'll, think? I'll, I'll, I, I have no idea either. I, I don't no, know. Uh... I'll have to investigate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's take a short break and we'll be right back in just a moment. Hey folks, are you in the market for some new barbecue merch? We have our award-winning Hail Mary merch available on our website, smokinghotconfessions.com slash shop. Winter is coming, so we do have some nice, beautiful, warm uh, beanies for you. The nice, thick hoodies are there as well. We've still got our T-shirts available, and we've also got our Smoking Hot Confessions tumblers, which are fantastic at keeping your hot drinks hot and your cold drinks cold. Now, we do have a... Um, some ebooks over there for you as well. So make sure you head on over there, check that out. And don't forget, that's where we're going to be updating all the BarbieCon information as well. So make sure you head on over there, smokinghotconfessions.com slash shop. It would really support us. It would support the show and we would love you forever. So thank you very much. Head on over there, check it out, smokinghotconfessions.com slash shop. You're listening to the internationally awarded Smoking Hot Confessions podcast with massive barbecue nerd, Ben Arnott. All righty, Amanda. Now, we've just got a, um, a, a fellow who's just put up a comment while I was there talking about the, uh, the merch, and I can see on Facebook, it's actually come from Jared Moore, who's an Indigenous fellow from uh, just south of Sydney there. He's been following the show from the start. And oh, he's fabulous. Written, yeah, he's written, yum, best I've been using native spices most of my life from my nan. So his nan's actually taught him a lot about uh, indigenous cooking and spices and all that sort of stuff. So he's, uh, he, he's here I've, with us today. I've got a uh, great to hear from you. Um, I've got an indigenous friend um, who I've been friends with for a really long time. Um, and she grew up partly on South Stradbroke Island. So talking about seafood, um, her grandmother, used to catch fresh seafood from dinner off the beach and, and, and teach her and her brother how. So, you know, there's so much culture that's all around us that we've not really taken into consideration for some time, but it's great that people are so interested in it and, um, yeah, fabulous. Yeah, yeah. All right, now this part of the show is where our, um, our guests uh, share some wisdom, teach a lesson, uh, impart some knowledge to our audience. And you've actually got something really special lined up for us this afternoon. So I'm just going to sort of kick back, take some notes, and it's over to you. Great. Okay. Um, we are going to make a native basil and thyme crusted uh, beef tenderloin. Oh. Um, oh, we're going to prepare that. And on the Weber behind me, um, I've actually got some ribs that have been cooking for quite some time, as you know, and we're going to baste those so you can have a bit of a look. Um, so I just moved my camera down um, and this is 
Oh, yes, there's the beef Can tenderloin. You see that, okay? Yeah, yep, we're a bit crooked. Okay. Um, we've got the beef tenderloin here, and it's quite simple. Um, this one, actually, after we're done, I'm going to sear and then cook on indirect heat for all the family and friends coming over later. <laughs> um, so I'll start off with just a bit of a, just oil it up a bit. Is that tied up? Is that uh, string on there? It is. It is string on there and it's tied up so it will come out looking in a beautiful shape altogether and not fall apart. Okay, cool. So you're just basting that with a silicon brush there and some olive oil, is it? Yep. And then we've got um, some of this beautiful pure salt uh, from Victoria. They're really great looking flakes there. Yeah, and, and the flavour of it is, is so incredibly different to your normal salt. It's got um, – it's a reasonably strong flavour, but it's very fresh um, compared to your normal salts. And here we've got some pepperberry. I'll just give you guys a look at this. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah. It almost looks um, like ground so, coffee. Yeah, it's actually got quite a dark hue. Pepperberry is fabulous. Um, besides being a really interesting flavour, you can use it in sweet or savoury dishes. So – if you make it into a bit of paste and, and whip it through some cream, it'll turn it purple, which is pretty cool. Oh, wow. Um, so we'll have a little bit of a purple tinge to this. Um, then here, excuse fingers, this is the native thyme, if you can see that. Oh, yeah. So yep. little flakes, um, and that smells amazing. This is the one that tastes a bit a bit sagey, minty, and thymey all in the one. So it's quite, oh. a, quite an incredible flavour. Um, just do that there. So it's probably a couple of teaspoons of the native thyme. And then here I've got the native basil. And this one grows all along kind of south, oh, all, all along eastern Queensland or eastern Australia. Um, yeah. Those leaves are quite big. Yeah, it almost looks um, kind of like um, chives, like like dried chives. A little bit, but it's, it's quite a round leaf. It, it's curling up, so you can't... You, Oh, I okay. I okay. see that. Yeah, so it's just curled up, but this this one tastes basilly and and minty as well. So delicious. So I would just do it like that. Um, sear it a little bit on all sides. Um, I'll let it sit there for about half an hour. Sear it on all sides, um, and then cook it on an indirect heat till it's up to medium. So yeah. Yeah. Right um, now. Do you season that on all sides or do you just uh, just season the top of it? Um, there? I usually would, but I thought on camera I won't. <laughs> okay. Um, you can do it any way you want, really. Um, but the flavour's quite strong. Um, so you don't want to do too much. Oh, that, that's a bit, but probably not as much as you might normally do. Um, but it's gorgeous. You'll sit there smelling it all afternoon while it's cooking. Yeah. Oh, God, that sounds amazing. Mm. And is that um, part of the and- dinner tonight for the family? That is part of the dinner tonight for the family. And the other one is my ribs, um, which should almost be ready for basting if you're ready for that. Absolutely. Let's let's have a look. Okay. I'll just move that out of the way and we'll take a little walk over to the, the kettle behind. We're just crossing okay. the yard here to the, uh, to the Black Weber <laughs> kettle. There we go. Okay. Big reveal. I'm a bit scared now. <laughs> it's, been, it's been in there for a while. Um, yeah, can since, you see since that? Since 6am this morning, folks. Yeah. It's been a working project. Okay. Okay. Put that over. Now that's quite dark because I had to go and drop my kids off. Um, can you see that? Uh, not really. Is it possible just okay. to lift the camera up a little bit? I will lift the camera up a little bit. I might just put the glaze on. And then okay. You can see that first. That is such a deep purple colour. That's going to come out it's, incredible on those ribs. Yeah, and it actually tastes um, really, really good. Like nothing you've tasted before, but yeah, delicious. Okay, so I don't know if you can see that very well. Whoops. Yeah. We wow. Look at that beautiful dark colour there. Yeah. Um. So yeah. Hopefully that will turn out. Delicious for everyone to eat later on. Um, yeah. this, I just made this glaze in a saucepan, and this is something that you can you can make obviously make ahead. You can freeze it for a while, whatever. Um, that's I might move back over. I'll yeah, just sure. put the lid back on, and we'll. So we're just going to 
just let that set for about 15 minutes. Ooh. Sorry, Ben. That's all right. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> um, so that glaze there is made out of uh, the rosella flakes that you saw before. Yep. And basically you just put, oh, let's say uh, two heap tablespoons of the rosella flakes into a heat proof mug or whatever, pour about a quarter of a cup of boiling hot water on it, let it seep, um, then strain it, throw it in your saucepan, um, about a quarter of a cup of chicken stock and um, some garlic powder, onion powder and a bit of paprika. And you just boil that down until it's about a quarter of what it was to begin with and you come with, come up with that. So I it doesn't take that too that long. That looks quite thick, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's delicious. <laughs> now, I, I noticed that, that you didn't say sugar. So is there a lot of... Um, a lot, a, a lot of healthier options when we're when we're using native uh, herbs and spices. Um, the berry, oh, it's not a berry; it's a flower. Um, the flowers and the berries have quite a high sugar content. Um, and to be able to freeze it and things like that, the, the sugar will. You've got sugar in your actual sauce. Oh, sorry, it does have sugar in it. Brown sugar, um, oh. a quarter of a cup. <laughs> <laughs> and then you've also got the sugar and the butter in the in the foil after you do that. So there is, it. Yeah. Uh, what was it? It's a couple of tablespoons of, of brown sugar in that one. Um, when I make the lemon myrtle one, I don't I don't have sugar in it because you don't want it to be too sweet. Um, and realistically, the only reason the sugar's in, in for that one um, is because it's quite tart. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So good. Thank you so much for sharing that. That, that it, it, it looks like you're going to have an absolutely wonderful dinner and I'm actually jealous. It's... Uh, <laughs> It's it's looking much better than what's on the agenda here for us tonight. Oh no! <laughs> You'll have to get some of that camel. <laughs> I will. I'll have to track him down. He, although that was probably a good four or five years ago now, so I don't know. No, there you go. Yeah. Um, anyway, look, that's probably a good point for us to start wrapping up the show. So I'm going to throw it back over to you now. Give some thanks. Give some praise. Give some shout outs to people that have helped you out along the way, and make sure you tell everybody where they can track you down on the internet. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'd, I'd really love to say thank you to my husband for his patience. Um, I, it's quite a strange thing to all of a sudden say, I want to have a business about native Australian herbs and spices, um, but he's been a really fabulous support. Um, my mum particularly has packed jars and jars and jars of salt for me, which has been brilliant. Um, and I have my, my sister, my sister-in-law who started the business with me, um, and a lovely friend of mine, Natalia, and, and everyone who's supported me so far. So, yeah, I appreciate everyone's help. Um, and if you're interested in native herbs and spices or you're looking to find some, um, you can visit our website, nativeharvest.com.au. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, you can email me too. My email address is on there. Thank Fantastic. you. Well, look, thank you very much for your time. I realise that you're uh... – you're working this in between cooking all these different dishes for your family dinner tonight. So thank you for, <laughs> yeah. thank you for taking time out to, to, to spend an hour talking with me this afternoon. No problem. It was lovely chatting with you. You too. I'll catch you soon. Thanks so much. And there you have it, family. That was Amanda Trapnell from Native Harvest. How interesting is that? We've got all this incredible uh, fresh uh, herbs and spices and all this sort of stuff available here and most of us we're not even aware of it so it's great to get this word out there get the knowledge out there and i'm dead serious i would love to see a native ingredients only category at a barbecue competition only native proteins only native herbs and spices let's do it let's make that happen and i think that uh, that that amanda is going to be a great partner for whichever promoter decides to put that on so do check her out nativeharvest.com.au she's got some great looking stuff She's good friends with Brett Connell and everybody loves Brett Connell. So, you know, he's, uh, she's, she's more than vouched for in that regard. So that's about all the time we have for today. Make sure you, that you remember BarbieCon. Keep an eye on the socials and on the Smoking Hot Confessions website because we are going to be bringing that live virtual event to you very soon. And also the merch, if you want to support the show, grab a T-shirt or a hoodie, we'd really appreciate it. But that is it. So until next time, take care of each other and keep on queuing. Thanks for listening to the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast. Head on over to smokinghotconfessions.com for recipes, tips, and Ben's own confessions.